Hi guys, welcome back to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice. I'm an entrepreneur and attorney licensed in both New York and Florida. We've been covering the events and the characters involved in the murder of FSU law professor Dan Markell over the past few months. I've taken you through convicted murderer Charlie Adelson's Tortugas Lane house in Fort Lauderdale, which just sold earlier this month. At the time of recording, it's currently February 2024. We've peeled back the mask of Wendy Adelson and seen how she portrays herself to others, all while knowing her family's secrets. We've contemplated the personality of Donna Adelson, how others view her and listen to her uncensored thoughts when she thought we weren't listening. Today, we're not gonna be looking at a person per se, but rather a vehicle controlled by these same characters. We're analyzing the Adelson Institute from a small business perspective. What I enjoy most about our practice is restoring a person's smile. That often changes their personality and gives them a more positive outlook on life. Our practice uses the most modern dental technology from rotary endodontics, computer generated ceramic restorations, digital radiographs, intraoral photography, and of course, we use nitrous oxide and oral sedation for the highest level of patient comfort and relaxation. The Adelson Institute for Aesthetics and Implant Dentistry, LLC, was first registered as a limited liability company in Florida in July of 2012, owned by Charlie Adelson alone. This coincides with the registration of Woodmont Dental Holding, LLC, also registered in July 2012 and owned by Charlie alone. Woodmont Dental Holding purchased the real estate where the Adelson Institute was located, 7737 North University Drive, units 207, 208, and 209, from the Harvey and Donna Adelson Family Trust, the same month that the businesses were created. This is what it looked like in 2019, courtesy of Google Maps, And here's what it looks like today, courtesy of yours truly. So within a matter of weeks, 
the Adelson Institute and Woodmont Dental Holding were incorporated with Charlie at the helm and the Adelson parents had sold the physical office condos to Charlie through his company. Now we know that both Charlie and Harvey worked providing services to the Adelson Institute, but it wasn't quite as simple as that. It's not uncommon for professionals like medical professionals to incorporate themselves as a professional association. This is what the PA at the end of their very long names stands for. Both Charlie and Harvey worked for the Adelson Institute through services provided by their professional associations. Charlie's was started in 2004 and interestingly is still active. In 2015, the Adelson Institute records indicate that Charlie, the individual, not the PA, was removed as a manager of the Adelson Institute and Harvey was added as a manager slash owner. In 2020, the owner was still Harvey, but Charlie was added as the registered agent for the company. In 2021, he was listed as both the registered agent and once again, a manager. Similarly, in 2019, Woodmont records show that Harvey was now the owner and Charlie was only the registered agent. The following year, Harvey was named a manager and Charlie the owner. Finally, in 2021, the last year of its existence, Harvey was named the owner and Charlie was a manager. Both the Adelson Institute and Woodmont Dental Holding ceased to exist as of September 2022, when it was administratively dissolved by the state of Florida for failure to file their 2022 corporate registrations. Why all this maneuvering? I don't know, but I can speculate that it might have to do with financial incentives. It might have to do with appearing to own more or less or appearing to have more assets or fewer assets, just depending on the situation that they were in. If we put all the pieces into place, I would think it would look something like Woodmont Dental Holdings owns the offices. The Adelson Institute pays rent to Woodmont for the office location. The Adelson Institute contracts with Charlie's Professional Association and Harvey's Professional Association to provide services to Adelson Institute patients, and the Adelson Institute hires staff to run the office. So what was going on in the intervening years between 2012, when the Adelson Institute was opened, and 2022, when it was dissolved? We see that there was the change in ownership, that occurred on October 2nd, 2015, and Charlie testified to this. Now, remember when Erica Johnson, who worked at the Adelson Institute, called Charlie because the FBI was in the dental office waiting for her at the front desk and requesting information about Katie McBanawa? That happened on June 1st, 2016, only seven months after the change in ownership. Erica didn't know what to tell the FBI, so she ran to the back room to call Charlie for directions. Let's listen. Hey, what's going on? Hey, the FBI is here asking for records for Katie. Um, for what? Um, that she that she works here. Um, I would, um, I wouldn't uh, give anything. Yeah, and they, the ex, the ex, did she work there? I was like, yeah, she works there, but I don't know what you want. Because remember, Erica, we sent that. Erica, Erica. Yeah. Do me a favor. Um, I'm not there right now. Uh-huh. And I'm in surgery. Uh-huh. But it's not my office. It's my dad's office. Uh-huh. So I can't give anything out. Right. I mean, you know, I don't have access to it. I don't know where anything is. Okay. So you don't have to, you don't have access to anything. So don't I, know would, where, I don't know where anything is either. Yeah. So I would do this. I would not, um, I would not speak to anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you could, I mean, you can do whatever you want, but I don't, it's my dad's office. 
Yeah. So I don't have access to to any of that stuff. Okay. So you can talk to my dad, and I'm sure they'll be able to get whatever they want from them. Okay, understandable. So if I if I had it, I, I mean, listen, you can talk to whoever you want. I shouldn't say don't talk to anybody. Um, no, you know, I'm gonna do whatever you can. Yeah, yeah, I mean, no, 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 I mean, I'm not. I shouldn't say don't talk to anyone. <laughs> talk to whoever on the planet you want to talk to. Um, but it's not my office, and it's not your office. Right. So you don't have uh, records to give them, and I don't have records to give them. So I'm sure they'll be able to help them out in any way, um, any way they can. Okay. So that's what I'll tell them. Tell them that, yeah, tell them that it's, it's not... I mean, it's not my office. The office was sold back to my dad actually a, right. a long time ago. So tell them that you will – so it's actually you're talking to the wrong Dr. Adelson. Right, right, right. So what you need to do is tell them that you will get in contact. So tell them uh, – I mean, it's not your office. You can't so get that right. No, yeah, they say within 20 days of the Florida statutes, provide above cause uh, with – are they, are, they, are they there now or do they just stand They're there, but you know, I'm in the back. I'm in the back. They're just waiting for me to come back. Oh, and they want records? Yeah. Do me a, do me a favor. I'm going to call you from a landline on your cell okay. phone, okay? Okay. All right, bye. bye. So we hear Charlie distancing himself as much as he can from ownership of the Adelson Institute on the phone call. They weren't asking about ownership records. They just wanted personnel records for Katie. Mind you, it hadn't even been one year since he sold it back to Harvey. Yet he claimed that he had no information to provide because it wasn't his office, despite the fact that by all outward appearances, Charles had apparent authority. This family loves throwing each other under the bus and deflecting responsibility. The truth, of course, is that we know Katie McBanowell was never an employee of the Adelson Institute. She never worked there. We heard testimony from Erica Johnson and Clarissa Lebrero, both longtime Adelson Institute employees who only ever knew of Katie as a patient and as of Charlie's girlfriend. Are you familiar with an employee named Catherine? I'm sorry, with a person named Catherine McBanowell. Yes. Okay, and how do you know? Catherine McDanwell? From the office. Okay, from being a patient at the office or yeah. being an employee at the office? No, a patient. Patient. And about how many times did you see her there as a patient? Uh, I believe two or three times. And how did you know Catherine McDanwell? She was a patient at the office and his girlfriend. Okay. A patient at Adelson Institute and Charlie Adelson's girlfriend? Yes. Had you ever seen Catherine McBanamo work at Adelson Institute? No. Katie herself admitted that she never worked at the Adelson Institute. Repeatedly during both trials, you said you worked at the Adelson Institute. You never worked at the Adelson Institute, No, right? sir, I did not. At each trial, the prosecution called a financial expert, Mary Hull, to the stand. She was a financial investigator for Florida's Department of Financial Services in 2016. Hall reviewed the financial records of Charlie, Donna, Harvey, and Wendy Adelson. She also looked over any income received by Katie McBanawa, including checks given to her from the Adelson Institute. In total, the Adelson Institute wrote Katie nearly $20,000 worth of checks between September 2014, two months after Dan Markell's murder, through 2016, right after the bump. Katie's bank records suggest that after the murder, she earned a majority of her money from Adelson-related sources, as well as cash. Before the murder, cash accounted for 23% of Katie's deposits, jumping to 64% the year of the murder. The biggest spikes in cash deposits were seen in July and August of that year, just after Markel's murder. In fact, nearly seven in 10 of Katie's dollars that she earned that year can be attributed to the Adelson Institute or cash. Katie's checks from the Adelson Institute, where Katie admitted she never truly worked, were all signed by Donna Adelson. 
Of the 44 checks written to her, nearly all were either paid in advance to her or written on sequential checks. This pattern is in direct contradiction to how actual Adelson Institute employees, Orisa Labrero and Erica Johnson, testified earlier about how they were paid. How did you get paid by Adelson Institute? With checks. And about how often would you get checks from them? Every two weeks. Had you ever been paid for weeks of work prior to completing your work there? Yes. Um, when that would happen, would it be because the Adelson family was going out of town or going on a vacation for a right. couple of weeks? Right, they were the going time? away. They were going on vacation, so we got paid before. About how often would that happen? Two, maybe once or twice a year. Okay, so just once or twice a year. And when that would happen, how many paychecks would you get um, at one time? Two. Two. All right. Would you ever get four, five, six paychecks in a row? No. Were you on yearly salary or paid by the hour at Adelson Institute? Hourly. And would you get paid every two weeks? Yes. At that time, were your checks around $589 every two weeks for about 28 hours a week? Yes. Would you ever get paid for weeks of work in advance? Yes. And when would that occur? What was going on for that to occur? They would go on vacation. Okay. And when that would happen, when they would go on vacation, would you sometimes get two checks at a time? Yes. Would you ever get four, five, six checks at a time? Not that I can remember. Now, while there is nothing inherently wrong with writing business checks sequentially, it does raise red flags about a company's business practices. How is it that one employee is being paid from sequential checks for almost two years? Is the business not writing checks for other purposes in that same time period? Is this the only expense being paid from this particular checking account? How about the testimony from Mary Hull discussing Donna's moving thousands of dollars of cash between Charlie and Harvey's piles to make payroll? Like, are you even serious? Was that being appropriately documented? Were there, were they loans, capital contributions? Was it paid back? Was it written off? The amount of apparent commingling would make my CPA fire me. Are the books of the Adelson Institute accurately reflect, reflecting the business expenses of the company at all? And yes, employee salaries are business expenses, deductible business expenses. This means that when it's time to pay taxes to Uncle Sam, a business gets to deduct from its taxable income you know, the money that's brought in from conducting business, they get to deduct the cost of employees. Now, for the Adelson Institute, would that company or as a business receive any financial benefit to, reploy, to reporting to the IRS that Catherine McVanwall was in fact an employee they were paying funds to? Yes. Can you explain that for me? Um, it would have reduced their taxable income by paying out her salary. So if, if they list something as a paid salary, they can deduct that from their total income and then they would only be taxed on the remaining amount? Yes. In other words, it is a benefit to a company to hire employees and thus lower the amount of taxes it has to pay. That's a simplified version. There's a lot of nuance involved here and trust me, I'm not an accountant, but that's the basic premise. By writing off your expenses, you end up paying fewer taxes than if you didn't have those expenses. And an employee is an expense. Thus, a fake employee is a fake or fraudulent business expense. There's actually a term for this. It's called ghost employees. A ghost employee is a fictitious employee set up in a company's payroll system that receives paychecks. It can be a real person or completely made up. Either way, no work related to the actual business is being performed. They just receive a payment. Katie McBanois was a ghost employee. 
There are no personnel records to state otherwise. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, outlines basic requirements for employee record keeping, right? Since laws vary, best business practices will have employers use a seven-year rule for keeping employee files, as seven years typically covers state and federal statutes of limitations. What is typically included in a personnel file? Well, we heard uh, the prosecution asking this of Mary Hull. So first, there would be pre-employment documents. So all hiring files for applicants, as well as new hire paperwork, resumes, references, offer letter, job descriptions, credit, background checks, and I-9 work authorizations. Work-related records should be added to a personnel file as well. This can include performance evaluations, attendance records, training certifications, formal discipline or warnings given to the employee. The Adelson Institute, when served with a subpoena for information about Katie, merely provided in response a QuickBooks printout, which documented the payments made to her. No job description, no offer letter, no resume, no attendance records, nothing to substantiate that Katie was an actual employee of the Adelson Institute because of course, she was not. Now, the statute of limitation has probably already passed. I didn't look. But had the IRS investigated or audited the Adelson Institute during that time period, tax evasion or tax fraud, which refers to criminally avoiding or falsifying tax documents to defraud the IRS, would certainly have been a possibility. The same conduct that constitutes criminal tax fraud may also be considered civil tax fraud. It's up to the IRS whether it wants to impose criminal tax penalties, civil tax penalties, or some of both. So the Adelsons, in essence, put Katie on the Adelson Institute payroll to partially pay for a hit on Dan Markell. The Adelson Institute received a deduction for a portion of those payments to murder the Adelson's in-law. They saved, the Adelson Institute saved on paying taxes by paying Katie as an employee. Let that sink in. By the way, this is gonna come up in Donna's trial. If she testifies, she'll have to answer why she wrote 44 checks to Katie, who she, as an office manager, knew was not an employee. If her attorney, Dan Rashbaum's explanation he provided in his SCS interview can be believed, Donna may claim that she was under the mistaken belief that Charlie or the family or the parents or Wendy, somebody was being extorted. So while you can't take a tax deduction for drugs or uh, illegal activities, like hiring prostitutes or hitmen or bribes or kickbacks, the tax laws that I research about extortion are surprisingly simple. Per IRS publication 17, chapter 25, the extorted party, in this case, it would be the Adelson Institute, would have been able to deduct losses because of theft to the extent that those losses exceeded 10% of the adjusted gross income. Blackmail and extortion count as theft, but in order to deduct the loss, the theft has to be reported on the correct IRS forms. If you're wondering, it's form 4684, casualties and thefts. You then take the total from that form and enter it on line 14 of your form 1040 under other gains or losses. But to claim the deduction, the Adelson Institute would have had to convince the IRS or a court of the extortion under the IRS's definition of theft. So if your employee has taken or removed property with the intent to deprive the owner, that action counts as theft and it's fair game for a write-off. Now, Charlie, Charlie tried to convince one court of his extortion theory. He failed miserably. There's no reason to think that the Adelson Institute would have any better shot at proving it. So it was a fun thought experiment if you like nerding out like me, but in the end, I can only conclude that the Adelson Institute committed tax fraud and evasion by paying a ghost employee funds 
for a contract killing and taking a deduction for those payments. In summary, after reviewing some of the Adelson Institute's business practices, here are my top three better biz takeaways that any small business owner can benefit from. One, create and maintain accurate employee personnel records for all your real employees. Keep them on file for a minimum of seven years. You can refer back to earlier in the video where I list the types of things that should be in that, in that personnel file. Two, ensure that your accounting books and records are current and reflect activities in the normal course of business. Outliers and anomalies are red flags to anyone inspecting the books and can invite an audit. Be prepared for that. Three, guard against business fraud by dividing your payroll responsibilities. One person who does everything related to the business funds can be a recipe for disaster. Put layers of approval in place so it's just not one person who can go rogue. Of course, those better biz takeaways can only work if your business is not run by, well, a family of individuals who collude and conspire to commit illegal acts. That's all I have for you. If you enjoyed this video and any of the information I shared, don't hesitate to hit that like button and make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Thanks to each and everyone who's already subscribed and to everyone that comments on my videos, even if you're challenging any of my positions. I appreciate the feedback and your support. It's kind of hard to keep up, but I do try to respond or at least acknowledge comments in the first 24 hours after a video is posted. So don't delay, all right? Okay, until the next drop, peace.